Hey folks, I'm Leo Nikishin and this is 10 Rolls of Film. If you have watched any of my videos about using real Sony lenses on film, then first of all, thank you. I really appreciate that. And secondly, it means that you almost certainly saw this camera. Minolta Dynax 5. I've been using this camera for almost exactly a year at this point, so I thought it was about time I gave it a proper review, which it definitely deserves. Now, ever since the introduction of Minolta's groundbreaking autofocus single lens reflex system in 1995, the cameras they produced were divided into three distinct tiers. Cameras that had model numbers starting with 8 or especially 9 were the high-end, top-of-the-line cameras with all the latest features and technologies. Unsurprisingly, those were primarily targeted at professional photographers. A tier below that, models starting with 6 and 7, were your enthusiast cameras. Still very capable and very well built, they were aimed at serious amateurs, but were also sometimes used as second bodies by professionals. Finally, models starting with 5 or lower were the consumer models, intended for amateurs that still wanted an SLR with autofocus and interchangeable lenses, but did not require the features and durability provided by the higher-end models. And that is the tier that Dynax 5 joined when it was introduced in 2001. Let's take a closer look. And here it is. Now, starting from the bottom of the camera, we have standard tripod socket, battery compartment. It uses two CR2 batteries, which are not crazy expensive, at least. Thank you, Minolta. Then we go to the back, and we have our film window, our film door release button, and the film rewind button for rewinding mid-roll, so before the film is done. Loading this, this camera is really simple. You just press the button, open the back, put the film in there, pull the film leader over to this side and against the little red marker in the corner there, and you're done. Just close the door and the camera will wind up to the first frame for you. Then we have the on-off switch, which I think needs no explanation. We have the autofocus button, which allows us to initiate autofocus independently from the shutter release button, which is very useful, as you'll see. And we have spot button, which allows us to use the central, the small central portion of the frame as a spot meter zone. So for example, if you want to meter for something specific, like someone's face, for example, and not the background, then you can do that. Then we have, of course, the viewfinder. And honestly, the viewfinder and the focusing screen on this camera are fairly typical for this class type and uh, time. It's not bad. It, it does the job. But if you are used to, for example, manual focus SLRs, even consumer-grade ones, this will feel pretty small and pretty dim. Because as soon as autofocus became the mainstream, most manufacturers decided that basically no one other than maybe top-level professionals could possibly want high magnification viewfinders and bright focusing screens. So, you know, it's, it's not great, but it does the job, especially as long as you stick to autofocus, which I would recommend doing anyway. Going to the top of the camera, we have, of course, our shutter release button. We have our program mode and scene mode select selectors, which are probably the biggest <laughs> evidences that it is indeed a consumer-grade product. We have the button that switches between single shot mode, 10 second self timer, and burst mode. In burst mode, this camera can actually shoot up to, I think, three or four frames a second. Hmm, not bad. Next up, we have the hot shoe, which is not a standard hot shoe. It's a proprietary Minolta and later Sony I believe they called it multimedia interface, something like that. A proprietary mount, which is both a blessing and a curse. It's a curse because if you want to use anything other than Minolta or Sony flashes, for example, if you want to use, you know, non-brand specific flash triggers or manual flashes, then you need to get an adapter. They're not difficult to find. They're not super expensive, maybe 20, 30 euro. Um, but it's something you need to buy. It's something you need to keep in your bag or and remember to take with you. So you know, it's, it's not great. But it can also be a blessing because if all you want is a good, powerful on-camera flash, then you can find Sony and Minolta flashes 
for a lot cheaper than their Canon and Nikon counterparts because, you know, no one is making flashes or cameras with this interface any longer. So depreciation, yay. <laughs> then we have the screen with all of our information and I like this screen. I think it's clear, <clears throat> it's nicely laid out and it's easy to understand without resorting to the manual, which is nice. The only problem with it is that it doesn't have any sort of backlight illumination, so when it's dark, you can't see it. Then we have the two main controls. We have the function control on the left, and we have a control wheel on the front. I really like this control wheel. It's It has a lot of resistance to it. It has very uh, positive clicks. So it's really difficult to, you know, just bump it and change something accidentally um, or, you know, go past the setting that you want. It's very good. And the way you use this these controls is like this. For example, let's say that we want to um, change our ISO. We'll select ISO on this dial, then press down the function button in the middle and then use the control wheel to change the value. There we go. Now let's put it back down to 400. And this is how you change from aperture priority mode to shutter speed mode, from continuous autofocus to single autofocus, stuff like that. Um, in aperture priority mode, the control wheel at the front controls your aperture. When you are in aperture priority mode, it of course controls your shutter speed. Uh, and when you're in manual mode, you still have one dial, so something has to happen, right? This will control your shutter speed and then you can press the exposure compensation button down here on the side, press that down, hold it, and then the control wheel becomes your aperture control. On the side of the camera, we have the pop-up flash. It's small, it's not very powerful, but you know what? Sometimes th this flash will be better than no flash. Then we have exposure compensation button. Again, same deal. You press that down, hold it down, and then use the selector wheel at the front to change the value. For some reason, my copy of Dynex 5 consistently overexposes by about one and a half stops compared to both my digital camera and my external Sikonic spot meter. So I just have one and a half stop negative exposure compensation dialed in at all times. Then we have the lens mount release button. Just press that down, twist the lens, and off it goes. I like this lens mount quite a lot. It's very easy to use because, you know, the sort of as you hold the camera, your finger lands on this button very naturally, and then it's just an easy twist. And when you're putting the lens back on, you can actually see the red dots at the top. Because on some lens mounts, the red dots are you know, here somewhere, and how are you supposed to see them? But here it's really easy. I like it a lot. Finally, we have the autofocus menu focus switch at the bottom here. And it's not a switch, it's a toggle. So you, you know, but now we are in autofocus, and then you pull that down, let it go, and now you are in manual focus. You see that MF there on the screen? The problem with it is that you can't tell what mode the camera is on just by looking at the camera. Because, you know, it looks exactly the same. So, not a fan. Also remember, if you're using one of these lenses that have autofocus, manual focus switch on them, use the switch on the lens. Because if you use the switch on the camera, the camera doesn't know how to disconnect the gears inside the lens. And if you try to rotate the focus ring, you might damage the focusing mechanism inside the lens. Finally, we have a depth of field preview button here. I'm not entirely sure why anyone would ever use that function, except for maybe macro work, but well, it's there. And that's it. All right, but what is it like to actually use? Well, that depends on how you use this camera. Because if you want to use it like a proper, serious SLR, there might be some issues. First up, Dynax 5 is very light and compact for an autofocus SLR, which must be a good thing, right? It is, until it isn't. See how small this hand grip is? 
Now, it is actually surprisingly comfortable for its size and works very well with smaller, lighter lenses like the Sony 50mm f1.8 here. Same goes for other Sony Easy Choice lenses and also the smaller and slower Minolta primes like 50mm f1.7, 28 and 24mm f2.8 and so on. But if I go even a little bit larger and heavier and put on this Sony 50mm macro, the camera starts to feel noticeably front heavy and the grip is no longer providing sufficient support. Attach something even larger to the lens mount, like a 100 to 300 millimeter Minolta Apo lens, and the experience becomes downright uncomfortable. So if you plan on shooting with the larger zooms and really fast longer primes, like 85 millimeter f1.4 or 200 millimeter f2.8, this is not the right camera for you. On the subject of long telephoto lenses, unlike its larger sibling, the Dynax 7, and especially the 9, this camera does not have a mirror lockup feature, not even when self-timer is used. Minolta claimed that mirror lockup wasn't necessary because their mirror dampening technology was so effective that it was fine all by itself. Well, I respectfully disagree. Shooting at 200mm and especially 300mm, I definitely get some mirror-induced vibration and blur, even when shooting with a cable release on a very sturdy carbon fiber tripod and a heavy-duty ball head. Next up, if you want to be fully in control of exposure and shoot in manual mode a whole lot, this camera is going to make it very clear to you that it was never really designed to do that. Exhibit A. This camera has only one control dial, and there are no aperture rings on any of the lenses. Finally, there is the general build quality. Now, I won't go as far as to say that this camera is built poorly, because it isn't. It all works and holds itself together pretty well. It's just that almost everything you touch has a bit of play to it. The shutter button is a bit mushy. The spot metering and, on and autofocus buttons on the back are a bit too small and lack any sort of tactile feedback. The on-off switch feels like it belongs on a cheap flashlight. All in all, you know, there are cameras out there that just feel great in the hand. Cameras that have something that makes handling them a unique, exciting experience. Dynax 5 is not one of those cameras. But you know what? Expecting this little Minolta to perform well as a serious, no compromises SLR is a bit like expecting a Dutch Oma Fitz to do well at Tour de France. So what if we look at it from the opposite direction, as a point and shoot? Is it small and light enough? Well, if you compare it to something like Olympus Mu or one of the Ashika T models, then the answer is a resounding no. But compared to something higher end and with a faster lens, like say Konica Hexar AF, it is actually quite comparable in both size and weight. Is the autofocus and auto metering reliable enough? For the metering, the answer is definitely yes. It is reliable, consistent, even in tricky situations. And if you want to make extra sure that the subject is properly exposed, you can always use the spot meter function. Just remember to check if your copy, like mine, has a consistent over or under exposure tendency. Easy to check. Point the camera at something like an evenly lit wall and then compare the reading to an external meter or a digital camera and then dial in an appropriate exposure compensation to counteract that tendency. And Bob's your uncle. When it comes to autofocus though, I find that this camera has a bit of a split personality. The center point works really, really well. Fast, precise, confident, even in dim lighting, all good things. The other autofocus points, however, are best described as hit and miss. Mostly miss. <laughs> and that makes sense, because in very simple terms, each autofocus point is essentially like a tiny horizontal rangefinder. But the central focus point is a cross type, so it has not only a horizontal rangefinder, but also a vertical one, which allows it to focus faster and more accurately. Next up, does it have the stealth of a proper point and shoot? Can Dynax 5 blend in on the street? You might think, come on Leo, everyone will see right away that it's an SLR with a distinct protruding lens and that prism flash bump thing at the top. What kind of stealth are you talking about? But I think things are a bit more complicated. 
First of all, it's not all black, so you won't be mistaken for a professional photographer anytime soon. Second, as long as you stick to the smaller and lighter lenses, like the Sony Easy Choice Primes, there is no huge front element or beefy lens hood to scare people off either. And the camera itself is actually slightly smaller than something like Fujifilm X-T3 or X-Pro2, cameras that enjoy a lot of praise from street photographers. To my eye, Dynex 5 with a small lens looks more like a one of those compact long zoom bridge cameras that a lot of tourists carry around. So you have a decent chance of passing as one, which might be a good thing. I only wish there was an option of delayed film wind. Some point and shoots and newer Polaroids have a function where the camera won't wind on the film until you let go of the shutter release button. So you can wind the film away from the scene you just captured and remain unnoticed. And to add to all of that, of course there's a whole bunch of things that Dynex 5 can do that most point and shoots cannot. As you compose through the lens, you can see in real time where the camera is focusing. The shutter speeds go all the way up to a blistering 1 4,000th of a second. So if you accidentally bring a 400 speed film on a sunny afternoon and no filters to help you out, no worries, you're all good. Of course, you got a full suite of exposure modes, even a full manual mode if you really need it. I know I criticized the small hand grip earlier, but you know what? Compared to 99.9% .9 of all point and shoots, it is still a heck of a lot more ergonomic and comfortable. Finally, you got interchangeable lenses. Duh. And that's why Minolta Dynex 5 has become my go-to camera for short walks around town or meeting with friends or even snapping candid shots behind the scenes during photo shoots and so on. It has also been a great money saver and gas remedy because honestly, I can see no reason to look for one of those hyped up point and shoots now. As a little bonus, I thought I'd show you how I have my Dynex 5 set up, because there's a couple of things deeper in the menus that are worth mentioning. Right, so here is the camera, and I think the easiest way to set it up is to first reset the camera to factory defaults, because I think a lot of default settings make sense. And resetting the camera is very easy. You turn it off, then you rotate the function dial to custom, press down the function button in the middle of the dial, keep it pressed, and then turn the camera back on. The display will say CLR, which stands for clear, which means that it cleared the memory for custom functions. And really, just about the only custom function I would recommend changing is the third one. So you can use the control wheel to get to the third, because this custom function controls the behavior of the film leader or film tip. And by default, which is one here, uh, the camera will rewind the tip into the cassette with the rest of the film. However, especially if you're developing your own film, I strongly recommend changing that to two. So you press the function button in the middle of the dial, rotate the control wheel and change that to two. And now the camera will rewind the entire film but leave the leader out, which I think is very convenient. Another setting that you might consider changing is custom function two, because that controls uh, when the camera starts rewinding the film back into the canister. By default, it will do so automatically. It will just detect too much tension, too much resistance from, you know, uh, to trying to pull more film out and will rewind the film automatically. But Film rewind is relatively loud. It takes a little while, so you might be in an environment where you want to stay quiet. Uh, and in that case, you can change that to two, same way. Press the function button and change it with the control wheel. And then you'll have to, cha you'll have to use the rewind button here at the bottom of the camera to initiate the film rewind. And that's about it as far as the custom functions. Now for the rest, I would strongly recommend turning the I start off Again, just rotate the dial, press the button, change it to off. Because, you know, it was a nice gimmick for early 2000s because, you know, the idea is that by the time you get the camera up to your eye, it already has the focus and exposure locked in, but it doesn't always manage that and then it's just annoying and in the way. Uh, the sound, I'd recommend keeping off, at least I like it that way. Uh, and for the rest, 
that's about it. My favorite mode on this camera is definitely aperture priority because personally I just prefer aperture priority to shutter speed priority. And like I said in the review, this camera only has one control dial, so semi-automatic modes suit it really, really well. Last but certainly not least, uh, remember how I mentioned that this camera has a bit of a split personality when it comes to autofocus? Well, here's the remedy. If you use the autofocus button on the back of the camera to focus, rather than half press the shutter release button at the front, you will only use the central focus point, the great one, the cross type, very effective and very precise one. And don't have to worry about camera possibly selecting something else and doing a poor job focusing your shot. So just press that, wait for it to focus and then press the shutter release to take the shot. That's it folks, I hope you enjoyed this camera review and if you did, remember to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss future videos. And leave a comment down below with your favorite point and shoot, whether it is or isn't one really. Till next time.